So some weeks ago, a younger cousin of mine, about 26, reposted a meme that she must have found elsewhere on Facebook. This particular meme was an image of a young woman lounging on her bed, wearing shorts and a long sleeve striped t-shirt. She had red headphones around her ears. Next to her lies a closed laptop and a record player. In the corner of the image, there's text that reads, I don't chase after people anymore. If they like spending time with me, they'll do so. If not, I'm content in my own company. On the surface, this was meant to be read as a good thing. Strength and self-confidence and whatnot. But I found myself looking at this image and being quite bothered by it. On the one hand, sure, the ability to care for oneself is to be celebrated. After all, is that not the goal of becoming an adult? But on the other hand, the overall sentiment struck me as false, possibly dangerous. We may wish and need to be strong and self-sufficient, but are we actually okay being alone and always content in our own company? The Surgeon General thinks no. We are living in an age of unprecedented loneliness. That this past May, the Surgeon General released an advisory about the devastating impact of the epidemic of loneliness and isolation in the United States. Even before the onset of COVID-19, and the isolation that came with it, more than half of US adults reported experiencing measurable level, levels of loneliness. Disconnect from one another fundamentally affects our mental, physical, and societal health. The physical health consequences of poor or insufficient social connections include a 29% increased risk of heart disease, a 32% increased risk of stroke, and a 50% increased risk of developing dementia for older adults. Additionally, lacking social connections increases the risk of premature death for some by 60%. The risk of depression more than doubles in isolation, as does the risk of anxiety disorders. Furthermore, when we are lonely, we also have a tendency toward cruelty not knowing how to repair disconnect, and forgetting compassion when we are feeling unseen. This morning's Torah reading, I think, is our story, our people's story, is a classic example of that particular phenomenon. Because prior to Genesis chapter 21, which we just read, we saw Sarah learn that she was about to have a child at the age of 90 likely already an unusual and then perhaps isolating experience. Sarah's first reaction was to laugh to herself, and yet God rejects her for that laughter. I have always felt like Sarah was a bit of a lonely character. And then this morning, when she sees the son of, the Hagar, of Hagar, the son of the maidservant, behaving in a way that she does not think appropriate, she, in turn, rejects him and his mother. She kicks Hagar and Yishmael out into the wilderness, where Hagar, too, must face going at it alone. Until God lets her see that well, we mentioned earlier, the well that will sustain her and her son until she finds him a wife, and, so until, and until the two can heal from their experiences of isolation, rejection, and loneliness. Hagar and Ishmael rebuild their own community and build a new family for themselves. But the rejection and division that Sarah's lonely tr loneliness triggered cruelty is unfortunately still alive today. We are still living through that particular division. We, every one of us, know what it is to be isolated. And we know the cruelty division can cause. So we have to come together 
to fight this particular epidemic of loneliness. Put bluntly, we need each other. We need community. We are hurting ourselves when we pretend that we don't. My cousin's meme, while aspirational, is a symptom of what I think is a misguided cultural imperative to say that we ought to strive for independence above all else. A belief that strength and survival exclusively come from within. An implicit directive that says that asking for help is a sign of weakness and that calling someone without warning, check on them, is intrusive. Not how humanity is supposed to work. And American culture actually has known this. In fact, in pre-Civil War South, one of the many ways that enslaved people were kept down was by separating families and dismantling communities, by forcing individuals to be isolated and alone. That was one of the ways in which they were robbed of their humanity to force loneliness upon them. So we're not able, supposed to be able to do everything for ourselves. We are meant to be able to turn to the community and to ask for help when we need it and to be assured that that help will come. We're meant to offer help and support when others need it and to ask for it when we need it. In contrast to my cousin's meme, I wanna share a different story. This one is actually one of connecting, of reaching out. It's one that I witnessed last January when Brad and I were on vacation in Jamaica. Some of you who attended Friday night services not long after we returned from that trip may actually remember this story. I think it was impactful enough that it needs to be shared with all of us again today. Most mornings, Brad would join a group going out on a scuba diving trip. And I, finding scuba diving utterly disorienting, <laughs> would enjoy a relaxing morning on the beach with a book or my knitting project or joining other, member, other guests at the resort in a group art class. One day, I took my book and I settled on a lounger in the shade of a palm tree toward the edge of our resort. The resorts in the grill are lined up along Seven Mile Beach, though the beach itself is public land. When you spend time on the beach, you see plenty of locals wandering up and down the length of the beach. Many of them sell things like bracelets and sarongs. Others offer parasailing or horseback riding excursions and some play music for tips. These vendors walk from one resort to the next in the hot sun and many of the guests either partake of their offerings or politely wave them away. Some will feign sleep behind their sunglasses so as not to engage with these locals at all. Particular morning, I was sitting a little bit further back on the beach and saw one of these musicians walk into the resort I was staying in. This musician walked with a crutch because one of his legs was amputated at the knee. His old khaki pants were tied in a knot below that amputation. His gar guitar was slung across his back in a big hat holding his long dried locks in place. As I watched, he lowered himself carefully into the sand and just stared up for a moment. He looked to me like a man used to being alone. As I looked at him, a guest from the neighboring resort walked over wearing black swim trunks and carrying two bottles of red stripe. He walked up to the musician, sat down with him, removed the caps and handed him one of the bottles. I saw you stopping to take a rest and I thought you could use a cold beer. Can I join you? And so the two had a conversation. The guest asked about the musician's life, what it was like to actually live in Jamaica rather than just enjoy its sunshine for a week or two. What brought him to be a musician wandering the beach? And the guest shared a bit of his life. When they finished their beers, the guests took back the empty bottles and the two said respect to one another as one does to end a conversation in Jamaica. And the guest returned to his neighboring resort. And the musician pulled himself back up and continued along the beach. Might just have been me, but I thought he looked a little bit less weary. He looked strengthened 
by what I think Martin Buber would have called an I thou moment. He had been recognized and connected to as a human being. He hadn't just been left to his loneliness. Two of our earliest rabbinic texts, the Mishnah and the Tosefta, contain the earliest records of Jewish law. You have probably heard of the Mishnah. Fewer of you may have heard of the Tosefta, its sister text. Both were compiled around the third century and, or, and both are organized into six orders that organize the laws that will later spark the discussions of the Talmud and eventually become the foundations of our halakha, the foundations of Jewish law. In some cases, the two agree. And in others, the Tosefta offers an alternate or additional phrase on similar topics. The one that I think is relevant to our discussion today comes from the second entry of the first chapter of the order of Brachot, which explores prayer. It's in the same place in both uh, the Mishnah and the Tosefta. Both begin with, with the question, beginning at what time in the morning should one recite the daytime Shema? Meaning how early is too early for the morning Shema? This is actually a halakhically important question. Because if you say it too early, before it's actually morning, you would really just be repeating the nighttime Shema and not have fulfilled your obligation for the daytime Shema. This is why the rabbis are posing this question. Both the Mishnah and the Tosefta begin their answers with the phrase, Mi sheyakir, for the moment at which one recognizes, can differentiate, can distinguish, the moment you seem to know something upon seeing it. In the Mishnah, there are two answers offered by different rabbis. Mishiach here, from the time that one can distinguish between light blue and white. The other rabbi in the Mishnah suggests it's really from the time that you can distinguish between light blue and leek green. In both cases, the answer essentially is that it is truly morning when there is enough natural light that your night vision has cleared and color differentiation has become possible, assuming you're not colorblind. What I want to highlight here for a moment is that both of these are something that a person can do in isolation. No one else needs to be present. In the Tosefta, however, we get a slightly different answer, though still beginning with that mi sheyak here. From the time when one can recognize, here from the time when one's friend is standing arba amot, four amot, which is to say, Six feet, you become familiar with that distance. Six feet away, and the two recognize one another. The Tosefta says, from the time when two human beings see each other. You know that in a world of electric lights, whenever we want them, it's a little bit of an odd brain exercise to imagine what we can distinguish in early pre-dawn light. But what a radically different understanding of what we should be looking for in those first moments of the day before we call out God's name. On the one hand, I do understand why our law settled on the color differentiation version of the Mishnah. For the majority of us with relatively normal color vision, this is the one that we can indeed accomplish daily with some consistency and the one that can still function if we do live alone. Not all who live alone are lonely. It should be at roughly the same moment in the process of sunrise that you can tell if something is blue or white or perhaps blue or green, maybe a little bit later in the morning. But how late in our day might it be before we even encounter another person, setting aside whether or not we recognize them? especially in today's world, and where in a world where most of, us, most of us either don't notice or actively ignore the weary musician walking down the beach in broad daylight, in one where we've convinced ourselves that we'd be imposing to call a friend out of the blue, in one in which we've been tricked into believing that being independent means we never need help or have to have others around or need to talk to others. So how do we combat this particular epidemic of loneliness? 
It's the vaccine regimen for loneliness. Mark told it to us before. Community, coming together, building one another up, helping one another, becoming a part of one another's stories, finding something to be a part of and people to care about. That Shalom can give us that. In a recent article in The Atlantic by Jake Meter, I read that in the last 25 years, 40 million Americans have stopped attending church of some sort. We Jews are no different. Synagogue attendance is at an unprecedented low. Meter says it's unfortunate and a problem for our culture. Participation in a religious community is generally correlated with better health outcomes, higher financial generosity, and more stable families, all of which are desperately needed when we face loneliness. Meter suggests that the defining problem driving most people who leave the church is just how American life works in the 21st century. Contemporary America simply isn't set up to promote mutuality, care, or common life. Rather, it's designed to maximize individual accomplishments as defined by professional or so and financial success. Such a system leaves precious little time or energy for forms of community that don't contribute to one's own per professional life. Workism has become the religion of America. And because of it, community in America, religious community included, is a math problem that for too many doesn't end up, add up. In other words, our culture says that our work is more important than our souls, our independence more important than our communities, our time alone more important than a stranger walking on the beach. We are strong enough, our culture says, we don't actually need each other. It has been shown time and again to be so untrue. In a time of loneliness, what is more needed than a community marked by mutual care, sharing what we have with one another, each, each of us according to our own ability? What could be more helpful than spending time with others, sharing meals, serving one another, and sitting together in each other's daily lives and joys and sorrows? And so I beg you to be involved more this coming year. Not because I need it personally, not because I think that God needs it alone, because I think that you, each of you and all of you, could benefit from it. Because when you are involved, you not only offer of yourself, you receive support. You will be called upon to give it. That is part of the work of community. In giving support, you build connections. In receiving it, you realize that you are not as alone as you thought you were. Gain strength from one another. Notice I didn't say come more. I said be involved more. Community connections do take work. But that work is worth it. And work, that work will help us be more satisfied with our lives, more in satisfaction tomorrow. Friends, I can't really create this community or that kind of synagogue that can offer deep, and connect, deep connections and mutual care without you. A good synagogue needs every single person to offer their time and their talents as well as their financial support. Community is not given to us. It's something we receive when we give it. As Meter put it, a vibrant, life-giving religious community requires more, not less, time and energy from its members. It asks people to prioritize one another, to prioritize prayer and study and community over simple professional accomplishment. And we are the ones who have the power to turn this epidemic around. We have the power to turn to one another. To be clear, as your rabbi, I'm already really proud of you being here today to hear this and to offer your time to one another. So I'm asking you to commit to truly being a part of this community, whatever way is best for you. Perhaps it's coming to services, perhaps it's bringing your children to religious school and talking to other parents while you're here. Perhaps it's putting food out for the kiddish or sitting with a family as they experience and face loss. Perhaps it's making sure that new parents who can barely find a moment to sleep, I'm asking you to be here for your sake. 
and to be here for one another, to help with the little ones, to help one another grow. Don't, like my cousin's meme, lie on your bread, bed and pretend to not care whether others seek you out. Seek them out, and they too will know to seek you out. Give of your time, give of your talents, it will make all of us stronger. Surgeon General concluded, our relationships are a source of healing and well-being, hidden in plain sight. One that can help us live healthier, more fulfilled, and more productive lives. Given the significant health consequences of loneliness and isolation, we must prioritize building social connection. Together, we can build community and a country that's healthier, more resilient, less lonely, and more connected. We have the tools to do this together right here in this room, simply by being right here in this room. We can be a part of community. We can call a friend because we're thinking of them. We can notice the weary traveler and offer a moment of conversation. Please, in 5784, show up for your congregation and let us know how we can show up for you. In doing so, you'll not only alleviate congregation's loneliness, you might begin to heal your own. And so, may Amatai, Korean and Shema, from what moment in the morning should we be declaring Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, Hero Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. Mi Shiatir Echad Tashini, from the moment when we see and recognize one another when we look around and see one another and we recognize the face of God in front of us. This year, may we be here. May we be a community. May we see and may we be seen. Shana Tova. Mm -hmm.